why are flamingos pink? I think it's a very interesting question. It's the kind of question that makes you go, hmm. And maybe your eyebrow raises, and maybe a finger or two extend, and you put it on your chin, and you go, huh. Why are flamingos pink? But I apologize. I've been very rude. I've yet to actually introduce myself. Hello. Hi. How are you? Oh, gosh, that's great. You all are beautiful. How you doing? Good to see you. My name is Jake Roper. What's there? There's the arrow, just to signify that I am me. Hello. And I make videos on the internet. Specifically, I make them on YouTube under the moniker Vsauce 3. And now, before I can answer about flamingos and their pinkishness, I first need to explain what is a Vsauce. Oh, there's a flingo again. And now let's go to a Vsauce. Click. There we go. We did it. The clicker is not real, by the way. It's invisible. It's all an illusion. And speaking of illusions, that's kind of what we do at Vsauce. So Vsauce, what is it? Well, it's comprised of three main channels. Vsauce 1, Vsauce 2, and get ready for it. It's going to be a big surprise. Ready? Vsauce 3. Oh, my goodness. Who knew? Oh, yes, yes. Clap for me. Thank you. Yes. I deserve it. Thank you. So that's the three main channels. And collectively, we have 14 million subscribers. Over 14 million, sorry, the plus sign. And we also have over a billion video views. But that's not what Vsauce is. That isn't what defines us. What Vsauce is, is curiosity. Vsauce is a delivery system, and it delivers delicious doses of knowledge in a convenient package. Vsauce is tacos, I think. Also, just to let you know, from now on, the all the other slides are going to be tacos. There we are. But I should be honest with you. Vsauce really is just a taco shell. And what we put in the taco shell are these ingredients, these bits of knowledge, these facts, this trivia that we bring together. And hopefully it'll just be as delicious and as filling as the previous one. And we get our ingredients from everywhere, every place. It doesn't matter. We just want it, and we're going to take it, and hopefully it'll combine to form something that's tasty. And most of the times, it does, I think. I mean, that looks tasty, I think. I think it looks pretty good. What's up, Taco? Hi, Jake. Oh my God, it spoke to me. That's amazing. But some of the flavors that we have come in questions like, how much can you carry? Not just physically, but mentally. How much does a memory weigh? How much does an emotion weigh? Or, guys, what if the sun disappears? It takes eight and a half minutes for light from the sun to travel to Earth. So we'd have eight and a half minutes of just, yeah, awesomeness until utter darkness. And then what happens? And then we use things like video games and comic books and just normal literature and movies to explain physics and biology and psychology. So then we ask questions like, could Godzilla exist? Could something that large be possible on our planet? And in asking and answering this question, we then talk about the square cube law. And we talk about the biological limits of things on our planet. We talk about why things in the ocean can be much larger than things on land. And then we ask questions like, why are flamingos pink? And again, before I can answer this question, I need to answer another question, which is, who am I? And I don't mean this in an existential way, even though I'm sure you would all make lovely therapists. And oh, let's just take a look at Jake as a taco, because that's terrifying. Let's just make that full screen. There it is. Oh, boy. You know, I'm just going to have a sip of water, and I'm going to let you guys just soak that in. Oh, uh, really, just let it burn into your retinas. Oh, that's nightmares. That's great. Now, I find it odd, not just that, but I find it odd that I make this informative content, this explorative content, because I always hesitate to use the word educational, because I'm not a teacher, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a doctor, I don't have a master's or a PhD, I have but a bachelor's degree, and I have it in film and video. And besides that, I just took classes on psychology and modern literature. And in, in general, I was never particularly good at school. <laughs> that felt good to say. You guys are wonderful therapists. Thank you so much. You can send me a bill after this. Just talk to the TEDx people. They'll deal with it. 
so I was never really good at school, specifically in high school. So I went to a college prep school. And it was the kind of school where so many kids took AP courses that the grade point average was higher than a 4.0. And there I was with like a 3.2, and I'm probably being generous, but guess what? It's my talk, and I can make up anything I want. So there we go, 3.2 all the way. Don't look into my school grades. But the reason why I think, my excuse, is that I just didn't really care. When was I ever going to need to use the equation for angular acceleration? When am I ever going to really use graph paper? When am I going to need to memorize the periodic table in real life outside of school? It just didn't make sense to me. I didn't care. But in that not caring came an epiphany. I was in an English class, and the teacher assigned an essay about sense and sensibility. And I really, oh, I really dislike essays. Mainly because they're so structured. They're so boring. This is what you have to do exactly like this, in this format, with this many paragraphs, etc., etc. There's no creativity. So since I didn't particularly care about my grade anyway, I decided, what if I just made a video? So I did. I made a trailer for Sense and Sensibility, but I made it as an 80s action film, because why wouldn't you? And it was called Sense and Destructibility, and it was horrible. However, it started a trend for me, where I started doing things like this in other classes. Also, I just like the fact that that's still there. Uh, you're just, that's just going to be with you forever. Anyway, sorry. In other classes, I would do a similar thing when I'd be given an essay, but I started doing something else. I started writing narratives. So the teacher would say, and Taco's going to be the teacher, Jake, write an essay about nihilism. Thank you, Taco Jake, I will. And so I would do that, but I'd use Fight Club instead of a normal book. And I'd write about that, and I'd write it from the perspective of Edward Norton's character in the movie. And it was fantastic. However, I didn't know it was going to go well, and it seemed to. I started doing better in school. It was very surprising to me. And I thought there was probably two reasons why. One was my parents, not my parents, oh gosh, therapy, it's just coming out. My parents, oh gosh, my teachers. This is getting weird. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> come on, let's be professional, guys, okay? We're sharing, I we're sharing ideas, how dare you. My teachers, I thought, probably just felt bad for me. Or it was something else. And that other thing was that I started to actually enjoy learning because I was able to share what I understood of the curriculum in my own way. I was able to be creative with it. And that made me want to learn. It made me want to explore more. And I thought that was, that was very nice. So I don't necessarily think that, it's, that we all learn differently. It's that we all share our understanding of concepts differently. So I was talking to Bill Nye recently. There he is. And Bill told me a story. And the story was that when he was in college, he took an astronomy course by a man named Carl Sagan. Oh, man, that turtleneck really brings out the color of his eyes, doesn't it? And so in this astronomy course, Carl gave him an essay as his final paper for the semester. And what Bill wrote was he debunked this prank that you could pull. You would take a Polaroid camera, you'd take a photo of somebody, it would come out. When it was developing, you'd press your finger on the person's face on the photo. You'd hand it to the person without them knowing. they take it, and all of a sudden they go, oh my goodness, what's this aura around me? What's this halo? It was actually called the halo effect around my head. So that's what his paper was about. It had nothing to do with astronomy. And he passed, because Carl Sagan told him what was important. Oh, look at him. Look at those two. Oh no, back! There we go. Other way. Yes! You didn't see anything. Forget all of that. Just think about my face on a taco. That's all you need. What Carl Sagan told him was that it was more important that he had critical thinking ability than he did ability to recite facts about the solar system or about astronomy. Because what good is a fact if you don't know where it came from, if you can't tell the origin of it? And questions just push critical thinking. They're very exciting. I like them a lot. Good work, you two. Congratulations. <laughs> and so when I think about in classrooms when teachers give students an essay, and they say it has to be done exactly like this, well, you're just going to get a lot of just okay essays because you're not allowing people to express themselves in the way that they feel comfortable expressing themselves. Maybe they're better at painting, or they're better at composing, or they're better at making videos than they are at writing. We're all different. We're all unique individuals. And by not allowing people to show their brilliance, we kind of just encapsulate them into this little box and just capitalize on maybe what they're not great at. And this reminds me of a quote from Albert Einstein, which is, everybody is a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing that it is stupid. 
And that's kind of how I felt until I discovered video, that I discovered that there was a format that I could be proud of. There was something that I could say that felt relevant and that I was excited to share. And that was really cool for me. But also, I, I do think that structure is important. I mean, there is structure with everything. There's these magic circles, right, that we have that are in different places. We have them at home, we have them at work, we have them at school. And within this magic circle, there are certain rules that apply. And they change depending on the location that you're in, but we just kind of abide by them. In the classroom, it's no different. We have these walls that are built around us, these structures that we have to work within. And I think that's fantastic because it pushes you to be more creative within these boundaries. You have to literally think outside of the box. But the thing that I don't particularly agree with is that sometimes they'll say you have to get from point A to point B exactly like this on this straight path. And I always say, why? Why can't I zigzag or somersault or backflip there? Who cares how I got from point A to point B as long as I got there? And then I can explain how I got there in my own way. I think that's really important. And then if we can, we're going to do a thing together. Because this is a bonding experience, everyone. If you could, let's take out our phones. Look at that phone. It's delicious. Let's take out our phones. Let's just hold them for a second. Ah, just feel their cold, cold hearts in our hands. We all got phones? Oh, yeah, some of you do. That's nice. So the majority of our phones can access more information than any library on the planet. And they've not only changed how we learn, they've changed where we learn and who we learn from. And it's fantastic. So I make videos not necessarily just to answer the question that I've asked, but to share my mind, to share the things that have gotten stuck in my curiosity glue, these pieces that I think are fascinating, because the world is incredible. The world is amazing. And I want everyone to appreciate it, even if it is loud, even if it is quiet, if it's messy, if it's clean. It's beautiful. And I think that is a fantastic thing for people to realize, even though at surface level, maybe it's not as gorgeous as something else, but when you really get into it, it is. It's fascinating. It's incredible. I love it. And the hope is that always within these things, with these explorations that you take, that the question won't be the end, that you'll kind of see the answer and be like, you know what? I want to ask more questions. So in with that, we'll go back to our flamingo. Why are flamingos pink? Well. Actually, when they're born, they're not pink. When they're born, they're white. The reason they become pink is because of the food they eat. The algae and the shrimp that they devour have a pigment in them. And the pigment is what makes them that color. It's a similar reason why when you cook shrimp, it kind of gets pink, doesn't it? It's delicious, too. Ah, oh, shrimp. Let's just take a moment for all the shrimp. Love you, shrimp. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but that's where they get their pinkness from. See, it's not that interesting. But what is interesting, I think, is the journey. We ask the question, and then we go on a journey together. We go exploring. And we find out all these other bits of information that we never would have known. And yes, we get to the end. But the end just leads to more questions. Because we are all curious. We are all explorers in our own way. And when we hear an interesting question, we want to find out the answer. And in finding out the answer, we just get more questions to ask. And there's a physicist, was a physicist, named Richard Feynman, who I really like, who has a great quote that says, I don't know anything, but I do know that everything is interesting if you go into it deeply enough. And I honestly believe that. So thank you for your time, and thank you for watching.